Good evening, everybody. My name is Thomas Sheedy. Welcome to the Atheists for Liberty YouTube channel. I am the president of Atheists for Liberty. I'm very thrilled that we're going to be ending the year with once again another amazing stream. We've been setting up this Atheist for Liberty streaming series every Thursday night, on the most part at least, to provide enriching and good content for all of you. We have a lot of various different members and supporters of Atheists for Liberty with a lot of various different interests. Not only do we seek to defend Enlightenment values, but we want to platform some of the greatest minds of the 21st century. And already with the holidays kicking down, we had a great stream a week ago with Melissa Chen. We got into a great discussion about China, mental health issues within the atheist community, and a whole lot of other topics. You guys are really doing well with the Q&As here. And myself and Angel and the rest of the AFL team, we sometimes have to keep up. Uh, we might have to expand the amount of people we bring on board. Uh, because we are thrilled with the continued amount of support that each of you uh, give to us. We are trying to do our best by fulfilling membership benefits. And again, all of you can continue to support us. Uh, anybody who's watching who isn't a member yet, you can sign up as a member of Atheists for Liberty at atheistsforliberty.org. We provide a lot of incredible services and online programs. And we're going to continue to not only do that, but expand what we do as we go forward into 2022. So without further ado, I want to introduce... Our guest, very good guest who I've wanted to speak to for actually quite a while. I'm very thrilled that he's been able to make time in his schedule to chat with all of us here tonight. So Dr. Ronald A. Lindsay was a lawyer with the national law firm at Safarth Shaw LLP for 26 years before joining the Center for Inquiry as its general counsel and then from June 2008 until March 2016, its president and CEO. He remained as president until December 2016, helping to oversee the merger of the Richard Dawkins Foundation into CFI. Lindsay's PhD was in philosophy, with a concentration in ethics, and he has written two nonfiction books, Future Bioethics and the Necessity of Secularism, and numerous articles, including essays and college textbooks. He's the author of the entry on euthanasia in the International Encyclopedia of Ethics. During his tenure at CFI, the organization sponsored the Women in Secularism conferences. At the second such conference, Lindsay gave an opening address, which became the focus of a great deal of controversy including calls for the CFI board to fire him. Since his departure from CFI, Lindsay has taught philosophy as an adjunct professor at Prince George's Community College, more recently has begun to pursue the study of physics at the undergraduate level at George Mason University. He also wrote a novel, The Last Song of Goliath, which recounts the conflict between the ancient Hebrews and Philistines, the eyes of Goliath. He is disappointed that the novel hasn't sold enough copies for him to be accused of cultural appropriation. Although Lindsay continues to do volunteer work for CFI and the Secular Coalition for America, he is speaking today only on behalf of himself. So without further ado, Dr. Lindsay, welcome to the YouTube channel. Well, I'm glad uh, that you have me on. I'm looking forward to our conversation tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, consider myself to be quite a uh, historian when it comes to the atheist movement and the skeptic community. And I, uh, I actually have a, a, a larger history with you than you might know. Um, okay. So uh, my, my family actually has quite a bit of a history with CFI. While I'm the only atheist in my family, my father used to be a student at uh, SUNY Buffalo before transferring out, I think it was first or second year of college. And for philosophy, um, Paul Kurtz, oh, was interesting. his professor, yeah. um, he uh, he ended up seeing as a 17 year old that I wanted to go to a, this random CFI conference in Buffalo that that uh, the organization was hosting at the time. And he ended up doing some research and he found, oh, my God, Paul Kurtz was the founder. I guess he had a, a positive um, a positive experience then. But um, my first ever national conference when I was starting to get into organized atheism and secularism and skepticism was the CFI leadership conference in 2015. And I remember meeting you actually, you gave an entire address to us students as we were the, the next future generation of secularism and secularism. <laughs> um, I guess you gave a, uh, a very good address then. Um, well, although you. I know that there were some in the audience that definitely did not uh, continue um, their careers in the movement. I uh, most certainly did, however, and it was through that conference and numerous other conferences that I learned a lot of skills as to how to be a leader, how to be effective, how to care about secular values, um, and it's and it's it's memories that I've cultivated to this day that have still made me um, quite passionate. Yeah, I'm very, about I'm very happy to hear that. Very happy to hear that. So I wanted to just I wanted to just go into that there. 
Um, but I think we can get into the meat of a certain topic um, right away. Um, as I told you, I consider myself to be quite a historian when it comes to the atheist community and the skeptic community. And you got into quite a bit of beef eight years ago, beef that I would argue still is slightly discussed to this day within within the movement. But I think it is something that is necessary that should be discussed. You care very much about women's rights, I would argue. You care about, uh, for, you know, from the perspective of the former president of CFI, you focused a lot about how women were treated around the world. Uh, for example, in, in Muslim majority nations, um, under theocratic regimes. Uh, this was something that CFI wanted to tackle very much so early on, even more Definitely. compared to the rest Definitely. of the movement. So you, you've taken that work very seriously, so much so to when you were president of CFI, you hosted the Women in Secularism conferences. It was under the CFI banner. And you gave a speech, a very controversial speech back then, pertaining to not only as a movement and some of the criticism that the movement was taking. And, and I would argue you were actually fairly even lenient when it comes to that. So I would like to just give you give you a few moments to just explain sure. the purposes of that speech and what you hope to accomplish with it. Right. Yeah. So I uh, <laughs> don't have a, a special yearning desire to relive a controversy eight years old. But mm -hmm. uh, as you pointed out, I think it is important probably to discuss it because the issue that set off the whole controversy is an issue that remains relevant today, very much so. Uh, and let me just give you a little bit of background. Uh, is the whole thing, as you pointed out, CFI has always been a strong advocate for women's rights, both internationally and domestically. I mean, one of our key uh, advocacy issues was the you know, reproductive choice for women. Uh, and as you point out, I put the organization behind the idea of having the Women in Secularism conferences. First one was held in 2012, uh, went very well. I mean, the idea behind it was there was some sense that, uh, rightly or wrongly, some people have felt that women uh, speakers lead I think we lost Dr. Lindsay. Um, let's see if he comes back in a moment. But as he was explaining, Center for Inquiry was very instrumental in bringing forth the Women in Secularism Conference. Um, it gathered a lot of attention on the national level. Um, 2012 and then in 2013 was the Women in Secularism II Conference where he gave a very, um, very interesting address. Um, while we wait for uh, for Dr. Lindsay to come back, I'm actually just going to quickly message my guy on the backstage to see if he can uh, get him the link. As much as 70-30 oh, oh. split, yeah. Uh, you broke you you broke up for just for just a moment there. Okay, sorry. I think I think you were continuously talking and explaining things about the conference. You were talk, you cut out where um, you were talking about the how you hosted the first conference in 2012. Right, and I was talking about some of the motivation behind that. As I said, one was to give a, a opportunity for uh, women to have a greater role at a conference. There had been some discussion that not enough women speakers at some of the atheist and humanist conferences. Some justification to that certainly. Uh, there had not been enough attention to some issues that were important to women, such as sex discrimination or harassment, uh, and also just the, the history of women's activism in secular movements. And one motivation for having the conferences was that there was this disparity, undeniable disparity, in terms of the participation of men versus women in secular movements. Certainly at CFI, when we had conferences, sometimes the ratio would be 70 to 30. Mm -hmm. So with that, with that in mind, we decided, okay, let's, let's have this conference. And the first one, I think, uh, went very well, uh, so much so that we decided to have a second one because most of the people who attended the conference came up to me afterwards and said, this is great. We loved mm -hmm. it. Let's have a second conference. So we have a second women, second women in secularism conference for 20, in 2013. In between the first and second conference, this had already been happening before, but there was in that year especially, there seemed to be this growing idea that, uh, what well, to use a slogan from that time, anytime there's a discussion about women's issues, men should just shut up and listen, right? That there's this thing, male privilege, and because of male privilege, you really don't understand women's issues. And if you think you do, you're only just blinding yourself because of this privilege. And I was concerned about that. In particular, the CFI's organization devoted to free expression, free exchange of ideas. That's how we think we can move forward as a society is that 
meaningful conversation between people with contrasting viewpoints, perhaps, and no one should be shut out of that discussion. Now, that's not to say that people who have certain experiences that others may not have shouldn't be listened to. It's not the listen part of shut up and listen that I took issue with, right? So obviously, if someone thinks they've experienced sex discrimination, sexual harassment, and wants to talk about that, yeah, you listen to them respectfully, see what they have to say. But that doesn't mean they have a veto policy, veto on any policies that should be designed to deal with that issue, right? Men can, in fact, have meaningful input into those issues. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was something that should be mentioned. So at the opening for this conference, first of all, should be pointed out. And by the way, my speech is probably still online because I posted it once the controversy broke. So you can people can verify this. I spent the first half of the talk uh, addressing the fact, obvious fact, that women had suffered uh, oppression and discrimination through the centuries. I tie that into religious beliefs, etc. cetera. Uh, I talked about how I was hoping that the conference, by the way, at, at that point, I did welcome everyone to the conference. One of the myths about this conference is I never welcomed the, the women there. That's just false. I didn't welcome them at the beginning because I want to hit the ground running because I thought mm -hmm. this conference was important. I want to emphasize how important the conference was. And I, one of the issues I wanted uh, people to address was, you know, the different strands of feminism. Uh, obviously, there's controversy within the feminist movement about the right approach. And I thought this was something the conference should do. And at that point, I did segue to talk about how, well, when we discuss these issues, we should be open to having everyone participate you know, to right. listen to what women and men have to say. And I, I mentioned how I thought that the concept of privilege could be abused in certain circumstances to essentially exclude men from the conversation. And I thought that was incorrect. I didn't think it was that controversial a topic. I did want to point out, you know, my belief is strong, still a strongly held belief that this idea that you have to experience something to talk about it meaningfully is just wrong. Well, that set off the controversy almost immediately. Uh, part of the problem was, and this is you know, a quote or a paraphrase, at least from one of the first people who's commented and objected to my talk was, well, what's a white man doing introducing the conference, right? It's like I had no business there. I mean, I was the president of the organization. It was my decision to put on the conference, but apparently I had no right to address the and, conference. And don't you love this too? What, what does white have to do with it? Right. It's, I was it's saying, when I saw that comment, it's a gender related event. It's not, it has right. nothing to do with race. Right. And I was, when I saw that kind of, I was thinking, would it made a difference if I was a black man? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and after that, it, there was just, it was like everything I had said about uh, the oppression of women and how CFI was committed to ensuring total social and civic equality for women. It's like, I didn't mention that at all. All they heard was that uh, men are being silenced. And then, you know, Lindsay is contemptuous of women. It just it went on from there. And, you know, the CFI board uh, was flooded with a number of comments from people. And I should say on both sides, there are people who supported me as well. And it actually, you know, one thing I didn't bring out just for this discussion, because actually something in my study I keep as inspiration is a comment that was set in that I thought this is one of the comments objecting to mine talk. And I thought because it was so thoughtful and I think epitomizes the careful analysis that people gave who objected to my to my speech, I should keep this to remind me of that, you know, careful thought process. So it's from a person, I won't mention it, to the CFI board, subject Ron Lindsay and CFI, quote, former member and former subscriber. I might consider resubscribing and joining if CFI shows that it considers women to be human beings. The continued presence of Ron Lindsay indicates otherwise. So there you have it. I obviously the subject of my address was to indicate that women are not human beings, despite the fact that we we're putting on the Women in Secularism Conference. At any rate, the, the board received a number of comments like that, but I received a number of comments in support. To make a long story short, uh, the board decided to keep me on, uh, which I'm happy they did. Uh, did not, however, I did recommend to the board a certain statement be released. They decided not to. I respect mm -hmm. their decision. In part, the reason was, let's just get this behind us. You know, we, it's, it's a drag yeah. in the rest of our mission, and we, you know, we don't I, want this to be the focus of the rest of the year, which I, I can understand. 
And when you think that from, a, I guess, a 2013 lens and 2013 perspective yeah. in the culture wars, right, that you would think that once this is behind CFI, once this is behind you, this is not something that's going to be, you know, continuously mentioned, continuously used as a weapon to attack you and your reputation, that from, a, I guess, a standpoint of professionalism, you know, even even from their perspective, oh, maybe you made a mistake or maybe you said something that that they didn't like, but overall they'll still support CFI, right? You, yeah. you would think that in a normal course of professional events as an organization, that this is something that you could get past. Yeah. Um, but spoiler alert, that didn't really happen so much. No, no. I mean, it continued to uh, be a point of controversy for some years after. Again, uh, it died down certainly to some extent. Uh, but, you know, that... Unfortunately, that that perception, that belief, mm -hmm. which clearly to me is a, just a very misguided understanding of, of communication uh, and just logically infirm, because if you think, just think, think about this for a moment. I was thinking about this when I was thinking about our discussion uh, this evening. Uh, I mean, it's so obviously wrong, this idea that you have to have experience, lived experience of something to be able to talk about the policy implications of addressing that issue. Just think of any host of examples. How many people, for example, have been tortured? Presumably, I hope, a small minority of humanity. Nonetheless, yeah. we all have clear views about torture. Most mm -hmm. of us think it's wrong, certainly as an instrument of policy. Same thing about just about any other issue. How many people have, uh, have been addicted to opiates? Mm -hmm. Again, hopefully not that many people, but we have ideas about what our policy should be in that regard how we should treat addiction, what responsibility companies might have regarding opiate addiction, uh, and to take a more controversial issue. But again, an obvious example, police are being tried for, you know, their actions they've committed, in some cases, to me, quite properly, because I think they have uh, you know, yeah. abused the position. And you're Nonetheless, not a former police officer. I'm not, I'm yeah, not, yeah, I'm not a former police, police officer. officer. We all, But we all have ideas about how the police should behave and conduct themselves. Yeah. We don't have the lived experience of having to make split second decisions about how to deal with criminals, or whatever. But we do have an idea about what the proper behavior of police should be. And I think quite rightly so. I think we have a right to those opinions and we can discuss policy implications. I certainly don't have a problem with people who argue that we should defund the police. I think they're very mistaken in that belief. I think it's counterproductive. But yes. for their, I certainly believe in their right to say that, even though they don't have the experience of having worked as a police officer. And, and also, um, I think this is actually a great way to move on into our next segment um, about the flaws of, of this woke identity belief. Yeah. I remember back, uh, I remember back when I was watching old talks, uh, Richard Dawkins actually gave this perfect um, talk back in 2007 about introducing really the new atheism to the to the atheist community um, at the AAI conference in Washington, DC. This was a 2007 event. And he actually gave a perfect example uh, as to why theists or, or have flawed arguments when they say that you have to be religious in order to criticize religion. You have to be part of a certain religious camp. You have to believe in Thor in order to criticize the idea of Thor's mighty hammer. He, he used like this, this meme of Thor's hammeriness. And everybody laughed. Everybody in the audience laughed at how preposterous this idea was. And we were all united as atheists and skeptics in that idea that we can criticize religion without being theists ourselves. Well, when it comes to the issues of social justice, half of our community, I would argue, is has uh, disagreed with us in that respect. I remember, um, just like you've been, you've been criticizing, you've been told that you can't talk about women's issues because you're a man. I've been told, and I took a contemporary politics class in my undergrad at SUNY Albany. I took a contemporary politics class, and I was told that because I am a cis straight white man, I cannot talk about nuclear weapons in a foreign policy setting. <laughs> I don't I have no idea as to why I cannot yeah. talk about nukes <laughs> because of my pigment or my genitalia, but apparently I can't. Um, but this is something that did take the skeptic community by storm. And it's really, really preposterous. If you are, for example, um a uh I don't know, you are you you could you could use this argument on just about anything. You're a woman in the Me Too movement, and you've been sexually mm -hmm. harassed or assaulted. Can you not criticize Jeffrey Epstein because Jeffrey Epstein is a man? Mm -hmm. uh, if you are critical of uh, police misconduct, like you used uh, mm -hmm. as an example earlier, we can't criticize p police misconduct because we have never had a history of being on the force. It's right. 
it's lunacy. It yeah. means that we cannot have open critique and dialogue about anything that could potentially affect exactly. our civilization. Right. Just because what we don't have the credits to do so. Good luck for the good chunk of Americans that don't have a college degree who want to talk about an academic issue. It's, sure, it's, of course, yeah. It's a gigantic problem. It, look, at the end of the day, either reason and evidence is going to govern or we're going to be held hostage to identity politics. Yes. And I just think, unfortunately, that it seems that the latter seems to be the way we're going. And it, it's it's a sad commentary in the state of discussion in the United States. Mm -hmm. to, to segue to a, another topic, but I think one that's very important and related to this, it's the you know discussions about systemic racism and critical race theory that are going mm -hmm. on right now. I have to say, I feel like I'm going on a limb here because I'm going against uh, probably every corporation in America, most educational institutions, certainly the White House, if you look at their website. Sadly. I am not convinced that there's systemic racism currently in the United States. Now, if someone made that statement, say in 1950 or even 1960, given the way the laws were at the time, I mean, there was still segregation in some places, yep. either de facto or de jure. Uh, we didn't have employment discrimination protections or housing discrimination protections. Mm -hmm. I would say, yeah, but there is. But since then, I mean, we had the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Fair Housing Act of 65, Voting Rights Act, uh, we've had affirmative action policies now for 30, 40 years. We had the 1991 Civil Rights Act, which strengthened right. remedies for discrimination. What is the evidence for systemic racism? And when you look at it, because I was interested in this, I guess, about a year ago, I wanted to say, well, why are people saying this? Because it's just accepted now, accepted yeah. everywhere. Really? I mean, if you question it, you're a racist. Right. I mean, that's it. And that's how people shut down discussion. You know, they basically don't want to engage with you in terms of giving you evidence. It's well, you're a racist if you don't recognize that. Right. Exactly. Or you're using or using some sort. If you question, well, that's like a dog whistle for other racists. Right? That's another favorite expression, the dog whistle thing. So anyway, I looked at the evidence and, you know, you can go to various websites. You know, uh, Stanford has a website devoted to the evidence for systemic racism. ACLU mm -hmm. does, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at, uh, I, I read, I finished just not too long ago, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist, you know, Kendi's book. I bet you had fun reading that. I had fun. You know, he actually had a couple of good points, but overall, mm -hmm. I think his argument was seriously flawed. The evidence is the disparity between blacks and whites in certain, certain categories, like economic mm -hmm. categories, right? Uh, blacks disproportionately have less wealth than whites, uh, earn less income than whites, have higher, higher unemployment rates than whites, uh, have poorer health, health, health outcomes than whites, and a few other categories. So there's this, essentially they're relying on what's called disparate impact analysis. And not to get too much into the weeds, but I want to talk a bit about how that originated. How, why do we even talk about disparate impact analysis as evidence of either race discrimination or racism? It really took off in, in the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Civil Rights Act of 64. So the 1971 de uh, decision in Griggs versus Duke Power Company, Supreme Court was faced with this case where the Duke Power Company had instituted, by the way, the same day that Civil Rights Act actually became effective. So there was mm -hmm. a question about whether it was really legitimate in that regard. Anyway, these aptitude tests that you had to pass to get certain jobs. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, it's not discriminatory because it applies to everyone. The effect, though, was actually to shut out most black applicants for these jobs. Well, first of all, there was a suspicion that the tests were adopted for that purpose. But, you know, you couldn't prove that. So what the Supreme Court said was that if there's some business practice that has a disparate impact on blacks and you cannot show that it's needed for business purposes mm -hmm. and the co company couldn't show that, then that's discrimination. And that kind of makes sense, right? And that's how this whole idea of a disparate impact, if you so, show a statistical difference between how blacks are faring and whites are faring, that could be evidence of discrimination. But one thing that's missing from these claims of systemic racism is what's the cause? Mm -hmm. What's the cause? Because again, in the in the employment context, what you have to do is to show, okay, well, there's this test that the company is using, and that has that's causing the statistical difference, right? Disparate mm -hmm. impact. 
uh, or there's some hiring practice. They only visit certain colleges and those colleges are mostly white. Therefore, it has a disparate impact. If you look at all the arguments for systemic racism, they don't point to a specific cause. All they just say, and I looked at Kenny's book and he just says, look, if there's a disparate impact, that by itself shows there's racism. That's it. You don't need anything else. Because he, what he says is either it's systemic racism or we have to accept the fact that somehow blacks are inferior. And of course, if he sets it up that way, what are you going to say, right? Well, yeah, I'm back, I think that's that's ridiculous. Like no you got a loaded gun in any in, in either direction. No. Yeah. And I just don't. So I don't think the case has been proven for systemic racism. Now, if someone were, were to argue, for example, that, well, some of these disparities might be a carryover from the systemic racism that happened in the 40s and 50s and it continued up until then, the 60s, maybe. It might have some sort of argument, but that's not the same thing as saying the systemic racism today. That's saying, well, look, maybe there are things we have to steps we have to take to address these disparities because there's a it's a residue of prior discrimination. Can kind of understand that. I'm not sure that the you know causation is proved there, but at least you could understand why that argument is being made. But here, again, there's no there's no specific practice or policy that is being pointed to. Yes. as the cause for these disparities. And the problem that I have especially is that culturally, yeah, I, I agree with you. If they made if they made an argument saying that things were way worse back in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, but we have made great strides since then, but there are still some there are still some problems that that we might need to individually address here and there. It's a respectable argument, a way more respectable argument. Yeah. But the problem that I have with this, the, the CRT movement, the problem that I have with wokeism, the problem I have with all of this is that they are making the claim that the United States in 2021 is just as bad as the United States in 1961. That There has been no overall cultural, political and legal trend that has made the United States excel and soar when it comes to improving racial relations, when it comes to improving right. the notion of quality of opportunity. They want to wipe it under the rug as if no progress has been made, like things are just as bad and that America is awful and hateful and not this ever expanding free liberal place. And, no. and, yeah. it, and that's and clearly wrong. Right? Right. 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 There's been a tremendous amount of racial progress. I mean, I've seen it in my lifetime mm -hmm. and that's good. I'm glad. I mean, it's obviously race discrimination is wrong. It's, it's horrible. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, if someone were to say, well, there's still all racism going on, racism in the traditional sense of people having discriminatory attitudes, mm -hmm. I would say, yeah, unfortunately, that's still the case. I think it's improved quite a bit, yeah. but there's still some people who harbor prejudice, no question. Mm -hmm. But again, this idea, and then, you know, you would think then, well, if there are policies or practices that are causing these disparities, well, then let's look at the, what, how can we change that? You don't really get concrete recommendations. I look at Kendi's book, nothing really concrete. He taught, he ra rails a lot about, uh, well, capitalism is bad. In fact, he says, you know, racism and capitalism are conjoined twins. But how would he specifically reform it? Not clear. Mm -hmm. uh, he, because then he goes on to say, in fact, that, well, you know, I believe in markets. So I'm not saying we shouldn't have markets. I believe in free trade. I'm not saying that. Well, then what is exactly the complaint? Right. Other than historical one, he points out, well, you know, there were joint stock companies that profited from the slave trade. Yeah, true. And that's, yeah. you know, it's, like it's a horrible thing, right? <laughs> but, you know, I think we're a bit past that. Yeah. yeah. Past that to where none of us can remember those days. Right, right. Because nobody's alive from those days. Right. Uh, and, you know, I've looked at, again, I looked at the ACLU site, which does have a lot of good information. So I want to see, well, what policies? Because they said, okay, we have policies that need to be changed that would end systemic racism. So what are the policies? They right. once say, well, we should cancel student debt <laughs> because proportionally blacks owe more than white students in debt. Uh, I, guess, I assume that's true. I've looked at statistics, probably true. Mm -hmm. uh, well, if we did that, how would that, it would help. It had, it had immediate help, obviously, for the people who owe the debt. Yes. I'm not sure in the long term that's going to make a, a big difference in terms of li eliminating disparities in income. Uh, and also you have to think about what the consequences of that would be in terms of what are we going to stop the student loan program or where is it going to do it and then pretend, well, we're going to do it and pretend you actually owe the money, but 20 years from now, we're going to cancel it anyway. I mean, uh, so I'm not sure that really helps. Mm -hmm. uh, they talked about expanding broadband access. I'm actually in favor of that. I think that's a good idea. 
and pr probably at the margins that may help some people who don't have access to information about jobs get better information and do job interviews. Yeah. Is Despite the fact that we've had the information age for like 20, 20 30 right, years. Right. But yeah, I mean, there are people who have limited access yeah. and, you know, maybe that in some cases, that means they can't mm -hmm. make the job interview or something. But again, yeah. that's going to be it at best at the margins, that's gonna make a difference. Uh, and then they talk about reparations. Now I have to say, you know, in principle, uh, I wouldn't be opposed to reparations if they could actually be administered. I mean, because if you look at, we do have a history as people know, for the Japanese Americans who were interned, we had a reparations program, $20,000 for people who were interned. Difference there was, these were people who were identifiable. And in fact, there was a cutoff date. If you died before the program went into effect, didn't get anything, right? Yeah. There was no like Germany had a similar program when it no. came to victims of the Holocaust. Exactly. A lot of modern countries in the modern age have right. adopted these programs for people that are alive, for people, for people that are alive. Still, exactly. And, and that's a problem. Them. And, you know, you can say, well, we should have done that after the Civil War. Yeah, we probably should have. It didn't happen, and that's a shame of our country. I don't mind if people talk about, you know, how Reconstruction was a failure. It was in many cases, mm -hmm. right? And again, that's something we should be ashamed of as a country. Yes. But uh, how would you administer reparations now after so many years? Uh, it's mm -hmm. it was impossible. I mean, because you'd have to trace how many people were affected by slavery. How is this affected now? Many people obviously don't need the money. Then you'd have the paradox where if you just target African-Americans, bearing in mind that the slaves, they came here mostly because they were purchased from African kings who mm -hmm. had made other African slaves. Again, I'm not trying to diminish the blame of white Europeans. I'm just saying that's, you know, the African kings, they were, and their countries were responsible as well because they were the ones who captured the people and made them slaves. Presumably we'd have descendants here of, African-Americans who came here after slavery, who actually were themselves who were enslaved people, are they going to be even worse? Because right. sometimes it wasn't even American ships that took these slaves as right. well to certain places. Sometimes it was Spanish ships. Sometimes it was other countries that still allowed the practice of importing slaves when right. the U.S. had a cutoff date. So right. then you get into the weeds of that with other governments. Right, right. And then you have, of course, and I'm, I think there's a good trend. I mean, obviously, we don't have these prohibitions we used to have about interracial marriage. So people are, you know, marrying, you know, different races, different ethnic groups. I think that's a good yeah. thing. But what are you going to do with a situation where someone's a child of someone who whose ancestor was a slave owner and someone whose ancestor was a slave? I mean, right. is it a wash? I, I don't know, right? So, I mean, there are a lot of practical problems involved in that. A three-fifths compromise. Yeah, three <laughs> All that being said, though, if that would solve the problem and it was something that we could actually afford, I'm actually less concerned about money because, uh, mm -hmm. you know what, it would increase my tax burden by $500 or $1,000, I don't know, whatever. I'm more concerned about what people are doing now to achieve this goal of equity because that's the thing now. It's not equal opportunity mm -hmm. anymore. It's equal right. outcomes, right? Everything has to be equal. Well, what they're doing, at least, at least in educational establishments, is getting rid, of example, for example, of advanced placement courses, right? Getting rid of calculus courses in California, things like that, mm -hmm. at least for juniors and sophomores, because, well, because only white students proportionally were taking advantage of that. Uh, getting rid of grading systems in, in some school systems. Why? Well, because it turns out, you know, blacks tend to get more C's and D's than, than white students, whatever. Getting rid of SATs, many colleges are doing that. Mm -hmm. How is that actually going to produce equal outcomes? To me, I think all you're doing really is masking a problem. Mm -hmm. It's like saying you get you get rid of homelessness by not keeping track of homeless people, right? Because you know you solve the problem. There are no statistics yeah. to show there's any problem. Likewise, if you don't have a grading system, if you don't have SATs, etc., well, there's no disparity. So problem solved. You know, and I think. I would think it's pretty obvious that's not the right way to go, but that is the way many school systems are going. And I think at the Ivy League, at the Ivy League, by the way, this is, we're not talking about just like community colleges or statewide institutions. We're talking about some of the most well-known institutions in the land who have had a history of academic excellence for centuries, who are who are who are 
doing this more than any any other institutions. And I bet you that the rest of the institutions will follow, um, which I find to be a real giant shame because then, look, I, obviously, I, I, I'm a big fan of as many people getting educated as much as possible, people having access to information. But if we claim to have standards as institutions, but then not really follow through with them, then what are we doing in t teaching intentionally dumb people who might not be qualified to learn certain material right away? That could dumb down our society as a whole if you right. if you you know calculate that for a few decades, um, and it's gotten me very worried. Um, yeah, and, and I think I think we're only hurting ourselves as a country. I mean, in terms if we want to have, I mean, everyone is talking about all this. We have to keep up with China, et cetera, et cetera. And, well, we certainly do. We're not going to keep up with them in our educational system. If oh no, they, they're probably already beat us. <laughs> right, you know, and it, it it's just ridiculous. Uh, and of course, you know. The emphasis now when people say, well, it's not so important that you teach math and science because we have to learn about mm -hmm. the aspects of critical race theory. And I know there's this whole controversy, and this is something that's bothered me, especially as, can I say, I mean, most of the time I voted Democratic mm -hmm. for a number of different reasons, in part because I just think, well, well, I can't abide Trump. I think, unfortunately, the Republican Party has sold itself to Trump, you know, the short-term interest maybe, they think, but I think it's a long-term mistake. Leaving that aside, it bothers me a lot that, especially in Virginia, I live in Virginia, mm -hmm. in the last gubernatorial race, there was this whole issue about, well, is critical race theory being taught in Virginia schools? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Democrats claimed, oh, this is just a dog whistle again. It's wrong for McCall to bring this up. It's so disingenuous because very technical definition, if you, if you want to argue, is critical race theory being taught? Well, it's not being taught under that name, right? It's not like there is, okay, okay, juniors, we're all going to take critical race theory this year, right, or whatever. No, it's not being taught under that name. So theoretically, you could say, well, yes, that is technically true. But the core concepts of critical race theory are being used to inform the way people are being taught. I mean, Virginia used to have, this is before I was taken down from the school board, uh, board of education website, they had a proclamation there about how critical race theory was to inform education in Virginia, right? The, the core concepts, the core concept being, of course, systemic racism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just it's so disingenuous to say that it's not being taught. It's like, like you know, you can say, well, Marxism is Marxism Leninism isn't being taught in the schools because we don't have a course called Marxism Leninism, even though. You know, students are being given assignments where they have to talk about how the you know capitalists are oppressing the proletariat, right? It's mm -hmm. yeah, but we're not teaching Marxism, Leninism. We don't have a course called that. So as I said, it's just it's just so disingenuous, and it bothers me. As I said, it bothers me as a Democrat that they they would take that position. Yeah. Yeah, and for the record, I'll just state to everybody here, Atheist Ruby, we're a 501c3 nonprofit, so we have members that are Democrats, we have members that are Republicans, we have members that are Libertarians, Independents. Obviously, you know, depending on the population of, of members that you might have, they might skew, it might skew one way, but we... We want to do what we can to fight for enlightenment principles and to fight against these kinds of ideologies, regardless of, the, of one part, one's party affiliation. I think if you are a reasonable Democrat, who is opposed to, to this this nonsense being taught in in the schools in your area? You should stand up for it, regardless of of how it might make you look. The same goes for Republicans. The same goes for Independents. And I think that's a good way. Just quickly interrupt into today to everybody watching. Thank you all for for continuing to tune in and enjoying this discussion and participating in the live chat. Eventually, we're going to go into answering questions and addressing comments in the Q and A. Um, but for those of you who have not joined Atheist for Liberty yet, you can go to atheistforliberty.org, make a last minute end of year contribution by becoming a member today. It's twelve dollars a year, one dollar a month, twelve dollars a year. We're a five hundred one c three educational nonprofit. All donations are tax deductible. Um, so we would really appreciate any and all support. Benefits are listed on our website. And one of the benefits is for you to then be more involved and to support us more and to also uh, help us out with setting up future live streams. We really do take all of our suggestions very, very seriously here. So once again, we're joined here by Dr. Ronald A. Lindsay talking about wokeism, identity politics, and quite a few other issues um, that he seems to be very passionate about, which is creating a very lively discussion. Already the audience has doubled or even tripled uh, since we started getting into this talk. And I think definitely the view count, the non-live view count, once this becomes a recorded video, is definitely going to increase much more after we finish up here. So thank you all for tuning in right now. We're going to continue with our discussion here with Dr. 
Ron Lindsay. So when it comes to wokeism, when it comes to identity politics, when it comes to critical race theory, you and I are very much opposed to these divisive ideologies. We are now spending a, even a decent amount of our careers either on the side or as a main portion of what we're trying to do in our lives, fighting against or at least critiquing or learning about how divisive and bad these, um, these belief systems and ideologies are. However, these views are being professed in the name of good. I'm against racism. You're against racism. I'm against sexism. You're against sexism. I don't like homophobia. I don't like transgender people being bullied or demeaned. I don't want people to, you know, commit suicide because of fat phobia or whatever other kind of uh, mockery that one could face. Um, I'm against discrimination of all kinds. Is there, are there any positives to this this ideology to this belief system to wokeism in and of itself because sure. i remember especially when it comes to that women in secularism speech you actually gave some some positive highlights to some of the changes that some of these people who don't like us very much at all um sure. wanted to make within the atheist community for instance sure look there i i think uh some of the impetus behind uh we'll call it the woke movement there are people with good intentions and they see certain problems and, you know, problems that should be addressed uh, is really just how it has evolved in, in terms of what people are prescribing as the problem or the solution, like systemic racism or what have you. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're racist if you, you deny that. That's wrong, right? On the other hand, to take the Women in Secularism Conference. One thing that came out of that, especially the first conference, was there were complaints about sexual harassment at conferences. Atheist conferences, humanist conferences, whatever. I didn't realize that was such an issue. We didn't have, you know, actually one of the things I did when I became president at CFI is because they didn't have much of a sexual harassment policy. Mm -hmm. My background as a lawyer was actually in employment law. So I knew, look, we got to get a harassment policy. So we put in place what I thought was a model policy, but it imply, applied just really to the workplace, right? Yes. Didn't think about applying it to conferences. So that was a good idea. Thought, yeah, we probably should have a, a mm -hmm. policy to apply to conferences. I looked at some other nonprofit organizations. Uh, I think it was the American Astronomical Society. They had a, a policy in place about conferences. So we we put that in place. We got some actually pushback from some people said, oh, you're trying to suppress behavior. That just, you know, that's innocuous and free speech, et cetera. Not really. I mean, the policy I thought was well drafted. And frankly, mm -hmm. We didn't have that many complaints. We had a handful of complaints after we instituted the policy. Most of it was resolved really just through discussions with the people involved. Nothing serious. Mm -hmm. That was a good idea. Uh, well, I, I actually have a, a question, if I yeah, might sure. mind asking then. I understand on a professionalism basis the need to have such policies. Obviously, um, I don't believe that sexual harassment is was ever rampant in the atheist scene. However, yeah. I do acknowledge that from a statistical perspective, there has bound to have been at least maybe a few instances in the span of organized atheism's history. Just like in any uh, conference scene in any event and in a corporate environment, sadly, there have been unfortunate incidences where innocent people have been harassed or even assaulted. And it is a shame for me to admit that. Um, but I would also make the argument that, yeah, I don't think in, in the atheist movement, when it came to a lot of our organizations and conferences, that, that we were promoting an unsafe environment, that at these conferences, sexism and harassment was everywhere. And therefore, we needed to adopt very quick policies to address this quickly or something extremely terrible was going to happen. You know, I know that you and a lot of other executive directors of a lot of the SCA orgs you all got criticized saying that, you know, these conferences were unsafe havens of harassment and hatred right. and bigotry. And I, I would just say that I don't think that was the case at all. And I've been I, to numerous yeah, different conferences. Right. Um, you know, I can't speak to other conferences, but all I can like yeah. say is if I conferences, I certainly wasn't aware of any. And then after we instituted the policy, nothing really substantial in terms of complaints. I mean, it was, yeah actually at least i don't know we had four maybe five complaints over a couple of years and half of them actually were women complaining about other women bullying them <laughs> in some way so i mean that's true i don't want to get into yeah. details because they're confidential but it just yeah. you know so it wasn't and i can't imagine that just the policy itself changed all the behavior that it was rampant before and the policy stopped it you know mm -hmm. uh 
But, you know, it's fine. I, I didn't have any problem implementing the policy. It seemed like a good idea. Nothing really was, I thought, harmed by it. Uh, with respect to, you know, the race thing, uh, I think it's actually one thing that good that's come out of it is the way we've taken a, another look at how history is in particular is being taught. Mm -hmm. I think certainly just looking back at my schooling, I remember the discussions of, you know, reconstruction were, were superficial best. And uh, most of the discussion focused on how bad carpetbaggers in the North were, which, you know, was kind of a, a minor issue, frankly. Very little discussion of how the effects of segregation in the 20th century. So I, I think the, the focus on how, you know, the burdens the black community has faced mm -hmm. uh, throughout much of our history, that's a good thing. Yes. That being said, on the other hand, again, there are some flaws in how that's being approached. The 1619 Project, for example, is, is a good in indication of that. Yes. In theory, it's it's not bad. It's good that you know we go back to look at our history, including you know the the founders of our country and how yeah they were slave owners, many of them, mm -hmm. uh, and how you know you could accuse them maybe of some hypocrisy uh, in that regard. Although again, you know there are certain constraints on what they could do at the time, mm -hmm. but they're also just mischaracterizations because they you know they're trying to make a certain point, so they have a very tendentious view of the facts. So they mm -hmm. take for example, I think it was Lord Dunmore's decree uh, after the fighting had started. The British issued a decree saying that, well, you know, if the slaves come over to our side, you, you could get you get freedom, right? You join the British side. Oh, and that shows supposedly that the cause of our declaring independence was we want to keep slavery. Uh, yeah. No, no, it's not. It's very minor. I think, first of all, all the grievances had started way before that, right? We'd had all the problems. Very much so. Yeah. The Continental Congress even right. debated yeah. slavery quite yeah. a bit. Right. There was a lot of contention. Right, there were a lot of contention, right. And, you know, it, it is a shame uh, that we didn't, uh, weren't more uh, progressive in the sense we tried to end slavery at the time. The reality is, though, that they had, it, to keep the states unified, there had to be a compromise with the southern states. Yes. So the reality is, if in fact, if the northern states, and there's more, more sentiment, obviously, in the northern states to just abolish slavery and end the slave trade immediately. Uh, mm -hmm. If they'd done that, we wouldn't have had a unified country. The Carolinas and Georgia, at least, if not Virginia, would have remained separate. And that wouldn't have helped the slaves at all. In it fact, wouldn't have. it would have been a confederacy before there was a confederacy. And what and ended so up happening is because we formed that yeah, imperfect yeah. union, you could right. say, yeah. in order to fight the, the greatest military force in the history of the world, the British Empire, getting a bunch of farmers and militiamen together from Virginia to work with farmers and militiamen from Rhode Island and Massachusetts, we were able to win. And what was the reward of that? The founding fathers even have even thought afterwards about the eventual abolition of slavery. Not many people know that we were trying to have slavery at least removed and made illegal by 1808. Right. Um, it didn't really go through, and there was still this conflict on a statewide level to, to keep the South within the Union, but but already there were plenty of people, even Southerners, even people from Virginia, such as Thomas Jefferson, who were thinking ahead and ahead of their own time, and we can't, well, we can't celebrate their accomplishments, we can't celebrate the good things they did despite their imperfections, we have to remove Thomas Jefferson from New York City Hall as a result right. of... You know, yeah, his, I think you know, that's ridiculous. I mean, first of all, retrospective moral judgments are always kind of chancy and you know iffy because you're you're applying the standards of the day to the you know middle of the 18th century. And the right. reality is, and it's a sad comment, but this is the way human history was. Slavery was, you know, it's an ancient institution. It had been around forever. Yeah. Because essentially it was out, out product of war and conflict, right? You yeah. conquered another city, another tribe, whatever. You either killed the captives there or you made them slaves. And that's why it happened throughout the world. There's no yeah. country that's been immune for that. Happened throughout Europe, happened throughout Asia, happened throughout Africa. Again, that's where- you know, Among all races. Slaves, right, among all races. And there was really no movement uh, in terms of a big movement to end slavery until the 1740s, 1750s. So yeah. the, uh, the generation of Madison, Jefferson, et cetera, that's really when things were getting underway. And yeah, they were actually, to some extent, you know, with that, they understood there was a problem here, which is yeah. to their credit. Did they go far enough? No, in retrospect, we could say, yeah, they should have done more. But again, there were practical constraints on what they could do at the time. 
So, and as you point out, you know, when you're thinking about who to honor, or whatever, you have to look at the whole picture, right? Not just some flaws they had, how they may have had shortcomings, but what did they accomplish? And if you think about what they, it was a major thing, a major revolution in thought that you would have a society in which consent of the governed was considered the way to legitimize a government. Divine right of kings. That was how most people thought of it, right? The European co countries, African countries too. You had hereditary kingdoms and chieftains and what have you. The idea that you would actually have people decide, would vote on policies, would elect their leaders, was a revolutionary idea. And yeah. it's to the credit of the founding fathers they came up with that system. Again, mm -hmm. not everyone obviously had the franchise, not just you know, with the way of slavery, but women didn't have the franchise either. Again, a reflection of the beliefs at the time, not to excuse it, but, you know, people don't have the benefit of foresight always, right? And historically, women were regarded as essentially second-class people. I mean, we have to face that, not to justify that in any way. Obviously, that's incorrect. It's wrong. Yeah. Women have suffered terribly because of that. Hmm. But uh, again, retrospective moral judgments are, are very ifty. It, it's, it's one thing to criticize people who have racist beliefs now, and there are some who do, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, racist beliefs in the you know, uh, early 1900s, uh, clearly you could criticize them. You can criticize the, you know, Confederates. I really don't care. You know, they move in Confederate statutes. I was always wondering, when I moved to Virginia, I noticed there was a highway called Jefferson Davis Highway. I was wondering, Right. What the heck is that doing there? So why, why celebrate? I hold a similar view. Um, right. I, right. Like I, I'm, a, I guess I'm a little more lenient when it comes to some of the statues, yeah. like Robert E. Lee. I can kind of understand why some people want to keep him up, but like, how like places of government, how right. like actual governments that have like com the Confederate flag on the flagpole yeah. in and of itself, yeah. that I had a real problem with, because yeah. the the symbol of the Confederacy itself was a symbol of treason. It was a symbol of right. slavery. It was a symbol of hatred and right. a, a symbol of disunity. Um, right. And so I, I always found that to be very weird too. And so, and, and another thing too, you know, we're going to be a, a great segment we could go into now is the criticism that you have received and the criticisms well I've received from similar bloggers and people who have gone after us, these identity politics people for, for daring to have these nuanced conversations, for daring to make that speech like what you made, like people like PZ Myers, people like Rebecca Watson and all these lovely people. Um, I'm still very much against racism. I'm still very much against bigotries and, and, and sexist policies all throughout, all throughout society. For instance, AFL right now is fighting a two front war. We are against wokeism. We see wokeism as a new religion, very similarly to the religions that the new atheists fought years ago. Yes, a big part of our branding is addressing and fighting that very similarly, like, like how American atheists used to fight religion. We have a very similar mindset in that regard. But simultaneously, we are also against theocrats and quite a bit of Zoomer theocrats, believe it or not, who have been trying to make repeal the 19th some sexy phrase to bring back into the limelight of public discourse. I find that to be disgusting, and I would stand against that, just as I know you would stand against yeah, that. But of course, yeah. Yeah. we uh, would never get the credit for that by our lovely critics who think that we're a bunch of bigots in the movement. Yeah, it, it's 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 very unfortunate, and uh, it goes into other issues as well. For example, I think you referenced before the uh, you know the transgender issue, mm -hmm. which, uh, as you said, and I, I certainly agree. I mean, I don't think there should be any discrimination whatsoever against transgender individuals. They certainly should be protected against employment discrimination, housing discrimination. They should yeah. be treated with the same respect as, as anyone else. Uh, also, I think some of the issues that some people have brought up, some conservatives don't want to just point the finger at them. But, you know, you, you get this thing about, oh, well, pronouns, you know, well, we well, shouldn't have to use these pronouns. Who cares? I mean, I don't care about the pronoun. If people want to be called she or they or whatever, mm -hmm. it makes no difference to me, right? Uh, I guess I hold the, uh, I hold, I, I, I do, I'm probably more conservative than you on this. I hold a, a view similar to Ben Shapiro in that personally, I will respect whatever you want me to call you. I'll call yeah. you whatever you want. Yeah. Um, but I also have been very keen and paying attention to a lot of people, especially um, individuals who um, we respect very much, some like Professor Dawkins, for instance, yeah. who have been merely just questioning from a scientific viewpoint, some aspects of this ideology 
Meanwhile, he gets his 96 Humanist of the Year award revoked. Well, that was to have that moment on Twitter. Yeah, I, I bet you were disgusted more than anybody else because well, you thought... wanted that unity with the Dawkins Foundation and the rest of the coalition and 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 the movement to see to see that kind it was of. It's very infighting. disappointing. I was very angry, frankly, as the American Humanist Association. I thought that was low, uh, and just hypocritical in the extreme no. because AHA for years. Have been begging. To, I mean, I have to know this because I, you know, work with the AHA. Right. But uh, they were begging Dawkins to speak at conferences. He was a big draw. They they got money from him. So I was thinking yes. at the time, well, if you're going to renown, take away his award, are you going to return all the money you got because you know you're milking him exactly. for this? It's ridiculous. And then I mean that continued their support of Dawkins and they're begging him to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it continued up. Uh, you know, the 2015, 2016, whatever. I ha actually have to remember without getting into you know, a lot of confidential discussions. So as you know, uh, one thing we did, actually one of the last things I did at CFI, uh, I helped bring the Richard Dawkins Foundation into CFI, the organizations <laughs> merged. We were concerned at that time that other organizations would feel like, oh, we're going to prevent Dawkins from, you know, speaking to other organizations and we're just kind of capturing Dawkins for our own because he remained a big draw. So in fact, uh, Robin Blumner, who is my successor, and I mm -hmm. made an effort to reach out to Roy Speckhart as the executive director of HA and assure him, don't worry, you know, Richard will still be available to speak, whatever. He was so grateful to hear that. Yes. And now, a couple of years later, they take away his, his award. And for the, the silly, I mean, I have to tell you, again, Richard Dawkins is on the board of CFI, which means he has a role in directing their policy. Yes. CFI remains adamantly in favor of transgender rights. Mm -hmm. We want transgender people to be treated without any discrimination. And there's right. a problem with bigotry against transgender people, and it's horrible. All that being said, it should not prevent us from discussing some issues where, you know, there's some science that indicates well, we should take a look at these issues because mm -hmm. it's one thing. And again, I don't care, you know, that makes no difference to me if someone senses they have gender dysphoria and wants to transition from male to female or female to male. Why would I care? It's their life more power to them. I hope they're happy in that decision. That's great. On the other hand, there are at least a discrete set of issues where that decision could impact other people, specifically in athletics, right? Yes. And specifically with males transitioning to female. It's just a biological fact that males, because of the testosterone they, they get in puberty, and other bodily factors, larger lung capacity, what have you, may be better suited for certain athletic competitions than women. And yeah. allowing a transgender female to participate in women's sports can have an adverse impact on the ability of women, other women, if you will, mm -hmm. to compete. Uh, the, the most recent example was this University of Pennsylvania student, Leah Jackson, mm -hmm. who again, you know, I understand why. I understand why people want to compete in sports consistent with their gender identity. Yes. It's perfectly understandable. On the other hand, let's not deny the fact that there's going to have an adverse impact on women, women who've been biological women their entire life, for them to compete successfully. And, you know, I'm not sure what the exact policy answer is here. Maybe there has to be some sort of compromise or whatever. But what bothers me the most is if you just raise this issue, suddenly you're 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 transgender folk, you're transphobe, right? And you're a traitor to science. You're a traitor, you're a traitor to or whatever, which, which yeah. makes no sense whatsoever, right? Because we're trying to bring up scientific facts, which I think are undeniable, right? They are denied. I shouldn't say they're undeniable. They're, they're undeniable if you approach this topic rationally and, and reasonably. So as I said, it's I don't I don't have a policy solution, and I'm not saying they should be banned because maybe we shouldn't ban them, but recognize the effect it has and don't try to deny it and cover up, you know, because I've had discussions with people. I had discussions on Twitter with us a couple of cases, and people say, Oh, you know, California has implemented they've that does, and there's no problem, whatever. And you know, sometimes you'll have even women athletes say, Oh, we don't mind this happening. That may be true. In some cases, it may be true. On the other hand, as this University of Pennsylvania case points out, a lot of women there felt cheated. They felt like, yeah, we didn't get a fair shake right. here, and it is it is causing a concern for us. Which really um, comes to show you that we have stuck to our principles. 
that we are still that we are willing to actually show that we really do care about equality. We do care about people being treated fairly. We care about women being treated fairly, that the claims made against you eight years ago in these silly little blogs was nonsense from the get go. Nonsense from the start. A way for, for this movement to tear apart and to where we couldn't work together anymore in the future. And now with what you mentioned about AHA, it's unfortunate. It's yeah. very, very, very unfortunate. Yeah, right. And, and by the way, the, the, the transgender thing, just to continue with it, but it kind of shows right. also the contradictions in, in within the woke movement, uh, especially with respect to this idea, that, again, the standpoint theory that you have to have the experience to be able to speak about certain issues. Okay, so you have someone who's transitioned from male to female. Does that mean they suddenly, even though they haven't had the life experience up to that point in time as a woman, they can speak about women's issues. Why? I mean, you know, right? It just, it, it creates a problem. Mm -hmm. Again, if you didn't have the silly idea that you have to have the life experience to speak about issues, it wouldn't be an it, it wouldn't be a problem. But it there's a problem kind of underlying problem. tension and contradiction there, right? It makes me laugh a little bit, being no. a critic of, of wokeism, to kind of see that infighting. Um, but you would think we would have a few more extra allies, like a few of those, you know, female right. radical feminists backing us up. No, no, we're we're bigots, so we, we, they can't right. dare even support us. But yeah. but I, at least when it comes to that topic, I'm starting to see eye to eye with with some right. of them. At least when it comes to yeah. that matter in and of itself. Right. Yeah. Right. So um, we have a lot of comments and questions piling up. I know uh, we uh, we wanted to. We, we got into a lot of material right already so um angel uh when you can feel free to uh bring up some questions and comments and by the way everybody for those of you who are following on social media stay on top of current events uh if you have a twitter account be sure to follow us on twitter at atheist liberty we come up with a lot of great public statements there and you're going to want to stay up to date with anything we release twitter is the best place for us to do it. So not only can you follow us on Twitter, but there's also a little notification bell uh, that you can hit when you uh, give us a follow. Be sure to hit, tap that as well. Um, so you can stay up to date to what we as an organization are doing. I will for now go out of the way and uh, showcase some, um, some, some uh, comments here, unless Angel is back. Um, so let's see. Um, oh, Angel is back. Okay. Angel's going to showcase some uh, questions and comments, and then we will, uh, we will respond from there. All right. I should add like some music to the background. We can have like the Jeopardy team playing <laughs> as long as we don't get in trouble for any copyright issues. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was on Jeopardy once actually. You yeah. were? Yeah. Oh. I won a couple games. Yeah. It was fun. Back, nice of course, a moment to clip out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, while um, while uh, while Angel's gathering questions as well, not only are we on Twitter, but we are also on Instagram. We just reached 600 followers on our uh, company Instagram. Be sure to follow us at Atheists for Liberty. Just search up our name and we should be the first result. Um, so if you have an Instagram account, be sure to also follow us. We come up with a lot of great graphics. We had a, a very amazing graphic for, for this stream in and of itself. So uh, be sure to follow us there and stay up to date on all the social media platforms that you use by following us and supporting us. So not only are we on Twitter, we're also on Instagram too. Jennifer Burns says we should be repealing the 16th instead. <laughs> I think this was the comment I made when uh, when we were talking about how there are some uh, some theocrats on the under end of the spectrum right. that that we are opposed to at atheist liberty. We're not only opposing the woke wokeism or the woke left, as some might like to call them. We're also still opposing theocracy. And there are some theocrats, Gen Z theocrats, who think the 19th Amendment needs to go away. Uh, that is ridiculous. But Jennifer, uh, I, I know a little bit about Jennifer's political orientation, so this kind of makes sense. But uh, she says we should be repealing the 16th instead. Um, that's that's a very interesting comment in and of itself. I'm pretty happy with our amendments as they are right now. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be determined in a future date. Yeah. All right. Next, uh, next question. Steve asks... Any comment on the eighth principle being pushed mm. 
in Unitarian Universalism. What I'd have to ask, what is the eighth principle? Sorry, I'm not aware of that. I don't know either, Steve. If you uh, if you end up explaining a little bit more in in the uh, in the live feed here, we will be sure to showcase it and we can have a discussion about that. Thanks for asking, though. Yeah. All right. Next comment slash question. Rune of the Gods, how you doing? He says, the plight of all social movements, they are destined to either dissipate or to become the tyrants themselves. I'm not sure. That's a very sweeping statement. I'm not sure that's correct. I mean, I, I think that it may be true in some cases. Uh, you know, sometimes social movements dissipate because they achieve the goals they were set out to achieve. Mm -hmm. I mean, think of the women's suffrage movement, which actually was an important movement for yes. you know, 100 years or so, probably, if you count from the Seneca Conference forward. Uh, obviously, after women uh, receive the right to vote, yeah, the, the organizations, that was their main focus. They, tended, they did tend to dissipate, but that's yeah. because they were successful. Uh, I certainly don't think they became tyrants. Uh, so, I mean, to some extent, sure, if a movement achieves its goals, it's going to dissipate because the, the primary rationale for that has gone away. I would think, though, speaking in, in a larger historical context, uh, the movement for what I would call liberal democracy, which I think <laughs> we can date to the founding of, of the United States, some antecedents before that as well, uh, and again, recognizing it wasn't perfect democracy in the beginning, but still the idea that ultimately consent of the governed is how you get a legitimate uh, government in place. That idea, I think, is still strong. And the idea that we have to have certain rights for that government, for democracy to succeed, such as the right of free speech, I think, you know, those ideas are persisting. I hope they continue to persist because as far as I'm concerned, that is the core right we need to have, and we need to keep, you know, arguing for that right to extend right. we can use free expression. And, you know, one thing I should point out is, you know, sometimes when we get into these discussions and a lot of discussions, I know in the atheist movement and in, in general in society about free speech these days, because with a whole cancel culture, what have you, some people point out, well, you know, the First Amendment only applies to the government, you know, canceling speech. And this is, you know, you're talking about organ private organizations canceling speech. Right. So I'm not saying there's necessarily a legal violation, though with public universities, sometimes you can get into that. Yeah. But certainly private institutions, they can decide who they want to talk or, or not. But there's a culture of free speech, which we should have. And essentially, we should welcome, especially universities, they should welcome people presenting points of view that maybe are contrasting with the viewpoints of people on campus. Because it's important. Part of a university education is to hear people with different viewpoints on your own, maybe viewpoints that very much challenge your existing beliefs and make you think about them. I, I know I'm very thankful. You know, I went to Georgetown Catholic University in part because I was a super Catholic when I was young, very religious, thought about becoming a priest at one point in time. So I didn't even bother applying to like, you know, Ivy, traditional Ivy League schools because I wanted to remain a Catholic. I had a brother who went to MIT and he came back with all these crazy ideas about how Jesus may not be a God and all these things. I didn't want that to happen to me. But I went to Georgetown and fortunately I had teachers that opened my mind to a lot of issues. We had, you know, since I was Catholic, I had to take theology courses, but they were taught by professors that introduced me to you know, concepts and ideas and it's just facts I wasn't even aware of, like the fact that well, there are more than four Gospels, like 40 Gospels. You know, in the early centuries, you know, the church just got rid of the ones they thought were kind of embarrassing, right? Yeah, in order to keep the church membership flowing. I've, the Catholic right. Church has done this for a long right? time. And to make a long story short, I took philosophy courses, took a course mm -hmm. specializing in David Hume, opened my eyes a lot. I'm so happy that I did that because obviously that's when I became an, an atheist, was at Georgetown. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we were not for the fact that I was presented with different viewpoints that wouldn't have happened. So this idea that somehow we have to have a safe space 
which essentially means you want an echo chamber, right? You don't want to be, you know, triggered or offended by people who are challenging your cherished beliefs. That's just so counterproductive. And it's just the wrong way to go, especially again in universities. Yeah. So I think free, free speech, free expression, welcoming contrasting viewpoints. That's the only way we can have progress. Speaking of uh, the comment made by uh, Ruin of the Gods, he says, good point, Ron. It's a bit of a sweeping statement. Okay. One of our most active uh, members, by the way, Ruin of the Gods. Okay. I know he is a very good guy. Uh, kudos to him for sticking it out through every stream and and uh, paying attention to what we do and what we care about. So um, what was it? Steve ended up actually posting his reasoning behind this um wokeism again uh this this eighth principle of unitarian universalism or whatever wokeism again racism mandating compliance among churches i guess maybe he's talking about how uh, and i've actually discussed this with previous guests i actually know of somebody who's in the um the baptist community and very similarly to how wokeism infiltrated the atheist movement, wokeism has actually now been also infiltrating Christianity and various different Christian uh, institutions. There's actually a civil war going uh, happening right now in the evangelical and Baptist communities uh, because some are more, I guess, progressive and are embracing wokeism and some are more conservative and are opposing it. Maybe that's what he's talking about. Right. Well, you know, clearly I would be... Uh regarded as a source of uh, disappointment, to say the least. If that were, uh, you know, principle that is being forced on a Unitarians is something they have to accept. Uh, it does maybe underscore the fact that, you know, some of these ideas, I know wokeism has been compared to religion, but I think that's a fair comparison. Also, just you can compare it to any dogmatic ideology. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the problem that, you know, these things are things you, you're told you must accept on pain of being branded you know, as sexist or racist or a, a transphobe. Uh, and again, that, that's a shame because essentially it's a way to shut off any meaningful discussion uh, right. that, you know, you, you can't object to this because, well, if you are, you're just, you're cast outside, you know, be gone, you know, you're anathema, right? Be gone, we're not going to make a mistake anymore because we don't do that, but basically just going to shut you out. You're now cast, mm -hmm. we're talking to, and that's it. And uh, again, it's a way, and it's a shame, especially in organizations that had portrayed themselves as Unitarians have, as a, a place where you could have open discussion, right? It was a place where dogma supposedly was not something that was gonna be imposed because you know, it was a, a sense of where well, you come here, we can talk about, you know, is there a God or not a God? Certainly no more God than one, I think was the underlying <laughs> principle. One God at most. I remember being told the same thing when I was yeah. just getting into the atheist yeah. community on the local level. Uh, I was I was involved with Long Island Atheists. I was president of Long Island Atheists for a while, and I also helped run meetings for CFI Long Island too. Um, one of the I was also at, at the time when I started getting involved. I really wanted to start the Secular Student Alliance chapter in high school, and actually CFI came to my legal defense along with a few other orgs and wrote letters to my school district, but. In terms of getting that support, I got support on the national level with you guys, but in terms of getting local support, I was told Unitarian Universalist places are the best place to go. They're like atheist churches. You could go there and you'll get a lot of old people to support you, give you money, give you support. Um, anyway, so it's 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 a shame if this is happening within Unitarian institutions as well. Uh, Steve ended up putting another comment here. I guess I guess this is a quote that he he took this from we the member congregations of the unitarian universalist association covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse multicultural beloved community by our actions the accountability dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions i hate to see this uh you know i know that other that ethical institutions or ethical um centers have also been facing this ideology recently as well um mm -hmm. it's it's a sad turn of events I it think. is sad i mean the way it's phrased i think is inappropriate obviously again any reasonable person uh anyone who's not a bigot is opposed to racism and again racism in the traditional sense meaning people who think people of other races are inferior in some ways, are not entitled to the same rights. That's wrong, it's horribly wrong. And we should oppose that with all with all our might. Uh, 
And I think, you know, the secular organizations, to my knowledge, have always done that. Yes. But the sense that there's a system out there that requires dismantling, as we've discussed previously, I don't see the evidence for systemic racism. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that's really pointing us in the wrong direction. It's essentially, as I see it, a way to drive us to accept the fact that we have to have equal outcomes in everything, that somehow equity, not equal opportunity, but equal outcomes is going to be the, mm -hmm. the test for whether we have, you know, a, a society without racism. Number one, I don't think you can achieve that. You're not going to have perfectly equal outcomes. And frankly, as I said, it, it doesn't, to me, I don't see that as evidence of racism because there's no one, no one's pointed to the policies that need to be corrected that are, are the cause of this imbalance. And you need yeah. that if you're going to claim there, there's some system there. And, you know, it, it also there's there are contradictions there, uh, which I don't think have been fully explored. For example, you know, so one of the things that people point to is the disparity mm -hmm. in income between whites and blacks. Well, actually, Asian Americans earn on average more than white Americans, especially Indian Americans, way oh, yeah. Americans, right? In, t in terms of educational attainment, Asian Americans surpass white Americans. Uh, again, I'm Virginia resident. I used to live in Fairfax County. I now live in Loudoun mm -hmm. County. Thomas Jefferson High School, the magnet school in Fairfax County, a lot of controversy about how they're changing you know, admissions criteria. Was that because white students were, were mostly you know, getting in? No, Asian students comprise 70% of the student body. Yes. So I, um, I, if you go with, if I can just finish the point. Sure. So if you go with a disparity argument, somehow we must have a systemic racism against whites. Right. I mean, who knew? Who knew? Right. So, so, so I, I, not to fully dox myself, I, the closest uh, institution, uh, educational institution I'm near is SUNY Stony Brook, Stony Brook University. And whenever I go to campus, uh, you know, either, either to get some extra, sometimes I, I find it hard to concentrate home sometimes. So sometimes I actually go to the local university near me to get some work done in the library or somewhere else. And whenever I go to Stony Brook University with my friends, with my colleagues, every, nearly everybody there is east asian i am one of the very few white people that is, that is on that campus i i've even and i promise this is not being done in the name of racism or anything like that we, we played a, even a fun game called like find the white person like we're literally walking we're trying to find a single caucasian we play find the white person and we, we tally up on our fingers how many white people we found um to be fair there's also not uh, you know uh there's not many african americans um and and other groups there as well although i'm assuming that stony brook is playing the woke equity game trying to get more african americans there um i i think they are doing that actually i'm not i can't confirm that but but it's absolutely true <laughs> on a col on college campuses um on college campuses i definitely have been seeing way more of an uptick in east asians and it makes sense uh they you know culturally um east asians have always been very successful um and have always prioritized education. Right. So again, if if difference in outcome is evidence of racism, mm -hmm. whites must be experiencing racism, which, you know, I think is yeah. ridiculous. And I certainly have no problem. To me, it mm -hmm. should be based on merit, right? If more, take the Thomas Jefferson the high school example, if they're doing better on tests, did better in, you know, the middle school in terms of their grades, have better essays, whatever, mm -hmm. great. We should be getting the best students in there, whatever their race is. Absolutely. You know, They're, universities are meant to be competitive. They're right. meant to compete against one another for, for, for when it comes to innovation, research, uh, just acceptance rates against other schools because everybody wants to have a measuring contest when it comes right. to that. Well, if you want to partake in that contest, you want your institution to stand out, get the best students. Makes right. sense. But no, that's racist now. That's right. racist now in 2021. One point I actually wanted to make this we were still talking about equity as the you know the touchstone for whether there's racism or not and what we have to do to correct racism because one thing that really startled me it's kind of in part because of my interest in bioethics and ethics was a discussion that appeared in the New York Times and I'm actually going to quote it because I want to make sure I, I don't you know miss misquote anyone or mischaracterize someone's statements. This had to do with the issue of distribution of COVID vaccines. And there was some discussion about who should be prioritized, uh, especially whether there should be essential workers first versus the elderly. And, you know, there are arguments on both sides, essential workers, because especially the healthcare workers, they're mm -hmm. the ones who take care of other people. Yeah, they should be vaccinated maybe first. 
Older people, of course, are the ones more susceptible. You look at the statistics, you know, overall, it's mostly people who are 65 and older who are dying or at least have the severe cases when they get COVID. So there was some discussion about that. And in itself, that, that discussion, yeah, fine, nothing wrong with that. But the way that some people came to a conclusion about how things should be distributed to me was shocking and also shows the extent to which this idea of equity and also almost like a question of payback mm -hmm. has infiltrated people's thought. And so I'm going to quote from, this is an article from the New York Times called The Elderly versus Essential Workers Who Should Get the Coronavirus Vaccine First, uh, published uh, December 5, 2020. I'm going to quote from Harold Schmidt. Harold Schmidt, an expert in ethics. If this is the new wave of ethics, I think we need to build breakwaters. Anyway, an expert in ethics and health policy at the University of Pennsylvania said that it is reasonable to put essential workers ahead of older adults, given their risk, and that they are disproportionately minorities. Quote, older populations are whiter, Dr. Schmidt said. Another quote, society is structured in a way that enables them, the white people, to live longer instead of giving additional, so period, instead of giving additional health benefits to those who already had more, we need to start to level the playing field a bit. In other words, even things up, let the old white people die. Yeah. My thought was, that's ridiculous. Ethics. Is that ethics? I mean, that's to me, I said, Apparently, he's very proud of this statement. I mean, he's allowed himself to be quoted in the New York Times. If that's what equity means, I think we're in for a, a serious reckoning at, at some stage. Yeah. I mean, that that can't be. The, I hope that's not what it really means. And I, I hate to sound conspiratorial, but the fact that these are legitimate, these people are legitimately being platformed to, and to legitimately profess those ideas on, on a publication as I wouldn't want to say they're accredited anymore, but plenty of Americans find them to be accredited, the New York Times. That is disturbing. I find yeah. it, I, I'm wondering if 2021 is going to be the year where we merely talk about these issues in an academic setting and criticize these people. And 2031, is, it could be a year that's much, much worse where, you know, what if, what if one day, you know, the government takes action and does something crazy like that? I'm not trying to sound like a, a kooky yeah. conspirator, but, but, yeah these kinds of conversations have set the stage for atrocities sure. and we have to take that very seriously um um this is why there was a, there was a big fiasco in my home state of new york when it came to when it came to this very issue when it came to uh the cuomo administration um and and nursing homes um not to get too partisan in that but but already that's been uh, a pressing matter in and of itself sure all right uh next question we'll go on for another seven minutes and then we'll uh we'll conclude the show already everybody this is this has been a fantastic chat really appreciate the questions and comments coming in we're going to uh we're definitely going to continue this and finish this off with a bang and uh and we'll go from there and uh and and let you go as we uh we all enjoy the new year so we'll platform a few more questions we'll get to the hour and 30 minute mark and then we'll finish up so angel whenever you're ready We have a few libertarians in this chat. So Ruin of the Gods is one of them. I, okay. think, I think libertarian is the best label to, to give to him. I don't want mm -hmm. to uh, intrude his, his views and beliefs. But uh, we have a few people that are unhappy with the 16th Amendment, and he wants to ask, why are you unhappy with the 16th Amendment? Why am I happy? Well, first of all, I guess I should ask you, I, I have to confess, I don't have a complete memory of the text of all the amendments, much to my shame and dishonor <laughs> so someone would have to remind me of the exact wording of the 16th amendment before mm -hmm. i want to say i'm perfectly content with it i don't know if someone has a co copy of the constitution handy i don't know if thomas you know exactly what the i i can i i actually did google this on okay. my uh, on my free time uh the congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from wow. whatever source derived without a port a uh, uh, Apportionment. I, 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 it's like it's not a stream without me making a spelling mistake. Basically, the income tax amendment. Of several states and without right. regard to any census or enumeration. Right. So it's the income. It's the one that uh, legitimizes the income tax because 
Without that, you couldn't have had an income tax because the original constitution prevented, you had to have it apportioned among the states a certain way. Uh, I, I don't see any problem with taxing income. I mean, first of all, it's essential if we want the government to operate. And you know, you can quibble about certain government programs. And yeah, that's a, that's a subject for a public policy discussion, right? You know, and I respect people's views about which programs should be funded, which shouldn't be funded, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of people think that, you know, we shouldn't have social service programs. I think actually we should, certainly to some extent. Mm -hmm. Some people would question the defense budget. Again, I think we need a defense budget. Unfortunately, we live in a world where there are people hostile to liberal democracy, you know? Uh, the recent tension with Russia and China proves that point. We need, we need a defense. Got to fund that some way. And unfortunately, I don't know how you would do that without income tax. You can't rely on custom duties, which is what funded the government for a long period of time beforehand. Excise taxes. I don't know how much you want to tax liquor or gasoline or things like that. It's not going to raise the trillions of dollars we need. So, and I don't see any principle, anything wrong with, with taxing income. And again, you can debate, well, what should the tax rate be? Should it be graduated or not, or progressive or not? I happen to think it should be progressive. Uh, I do think that people who are making significantly more money than others, because the, the effect on them of, of taxing them at a higher rate isn't that severe compared to, you know, taxing. You don't want to tax someone who's making $40,000 a year at a 40% rate, whereas mm -hmm. maybe someone who's making $5 million a year for that income above $5 million, they can, they can hit a, take a 50, 40% hit you know reasonably comfortably so i guess that's a long-winded answer to say i think the income tax is justified i don't see any special reason that it, we should foreclose that so that's true. Not it operated for a century because we didn't have that much in the way of government expenditures uh you know to fund the civil war for example which is, was the biggest expenditure we had at that time we had to issue a lot of bonds uh, there's a lot of problem about how they were going to be paid back. It was a huge government debt for a long period of time, which eventually was paid off, but it, it, it took a long period of time to pay that off. And we didn't have the social programs that we, we, we have now, uh, back in the late 1800s. The fact of the matter is if you didn't have an income tax, you could not operate the government at any level that we have, like we have now. And again, unless you want a country that is completely defenseless, and has mm -hmm. no social programs, social security, or what have you, you're going to need an income tax. I I think, honestly, if, if I have to speak on behalf of uh, a few of the people making comments uh, critical of the 16th Amendment, perhaps maybe we'd have to invite you to a, uh, a members-only Discord hangout session <laughs> one time where we'll, we'll have a, a live Q&A and maybe right. there'll, there'll be some back and forth. Maybe a, a nice yeah. member benefit, everybody. Uh, right. Maybe maybe, maybe uh, we can we can reach out to you and do that um, sometime. We got we got two minutes left. So actually, you know what? I will just finish the show. Thank you, everybody. Oh, there we go. We'll we'll, we'll answer this. Um, Casey asks, "Why is democracy the god that failed, and why do you agree with me?" I do think democracy is the God that has failed. I mean, first of all, the verdict's still out. We don't know how things are going to turn out. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm hopeful that democracy doesn't fail because I think, you know, I forget who said it, but democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. And I think that's true. I mean, democratic, look, we have problems. You know, democracy does not give you, does not render a perfect government. We've had many examples of less than perfect administrations at the federal and the state and the local level. So there's no guarantee you're going to have the appropriate administration at any of those levels. But if we had, what's the alternative? Some authoritarian system where someone takes over, uh, inherited power, uh, a party like the Communist Party, or maybe the woke party now that says mm -hmm. we're the ones who know the truth and you have to accept that and give us power. I think to me, all those are, are horrible alternatives. So I think we have to go with the democracy. And you know, how whether or not it's successful really depends on us, mm -hmm. whether we are willing to engage uh, with others and where we see errors, where we see mistakes, where we see people trying to foreclose discussion, whether we're going to accept that or decide that, well, no, we're not going to accept that. We're going to fight back. We're going to argue based on reason and evidence and try to get people to see the virtues of that and how that really is the only way forward. 
That will be the test of whether democracy succeeds or not. Is it going to? I don't know. I have to say sometimes I'm pessimistic, but you know, I, you have to continue the fight. We have to continue the fight, and we definitely will continue the fight into 2022. I think this was a fantastic show. I want to thank everybody for for tuning in tonight and for asking questions, and for everybody who has been tuning in to for these five live streams over the last few months. We started off with Dr. Michael Shermer as our first guest, continued on with former American atheist president and former AI executive director David Silverman. We carried it on by talking about wokeness and critical race theory with Dr. James Lindsay. We had Melissa Chen on last week to talk about China, the threat of China, um, and various issues of mental health in the atheist community. And we're ending 2021 by having Dr. Ron Lindsay on the program. We want to continue to fight in this new age of reason. We want to continue to persevere. And we're doing a lot of great things. We have a lot of online programs. We have a lot of in-person events that we're doing. For instance, Atheists for Liberty, our next in real in real life uh, convention that we will be at, we will be exhibiting at, will be at CPAC 2022. That's going to be February 24th through 27th in Orlando, Florida. That's how we actually got our start. We premiered at CPAC 2020 nearly two years ago. And we've had plenty of support ever since. And we've been taking a lot of your advice as members and supporters and viewers to continue our content to platform what you want to see. Um, and it's why it's very important that all of you continue to be involved, continue to send us your suggestions. And to, for those who haven't joined, to join at atheistforliberty.org to become a member to finish off the year with a bang. And we are going to continue to push and to promote this streaming series big time. Um, and we have a lot of great guests coming on in the first few months of 2022. We've already been booking up the calendar like crazy. And so we're going to do that again. Not only do we seek to defend enlightenment values, but we seek to platform the greatest minds of the 21st century. And we are definitely doing that. And we've ended this year doing just that as well. So Dr. Ron Lindsay, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you everybody for tuning in. See you all next year. It's going to be fun. Great. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed the discussion.